Okay, so <laughs> I'll get going. Um, and as people flow in, fine. Uh, so, welcome back. This is the fourth seminar in the four seminar series. Um, uh, the series, of course, entitled uh, Modeling the Dynamics of Evolving Morphology. And the topic today is Modeling Morphology Part Two The Evolutionary Consequences of Analogy. So today I'll start with a very short recap of where we're up to so far. Um, I'll pause for a little bit in case there are some questions that were still outstanding from last week, because I think some people may have had some that we didn't get time to get to. Um, once we're done there, I'll begin with today's material, uh, which will start with a short uh, prelude to introduce the idea of morphomes. Uh, and then we move on to modeling the evolution of inflectional systems under constant analogical change. So a quick recap, begin. Um, so we've been talking all along about models in seminar one, we started with some foundational ideas uh, that models um, typically provide a representation of a target system. Um, and that typically those representations are idealized and got comfortable with the idea that the idealization of models is not a failure to be realistic, but it's a strategic choice to keep things simple. Uh, we saw that uh, keeps throwing me out of my presentation and into oh, Zoom. <laughs> um, we saw that even false models um, can play a useful role in scientific progress. For instance, uh, exploratory models, which are exceedingly simple and obviously not the final model that you want to arrive at, can nevertheless give us a nice first step towards more elaborate, less idealized models uh, further down the track. And so they're going to be useful for getting the, the whole process going. Formal models uh, are particularly helpful for revealing where we're wrong because they don't let you hide your assumptions. It's all out there and you, you can see where you're, you're failing. This is useful because it's nice to know where you need to focus your energy to improve what you're doing. Um, and as part of that, we discussed um, Bayesian reasoning, uh, which allows us to perform nice quantified inference under conditions of uncertainty, which is what we as scientists are always facing. Um, and Bayesian reasoning, as I was saying there, enables this elegant uh, integration of bottom-up and top-down information. We then moved along. We looked at implementations of modeling for language change. Uh, in seminar two, we looked at some of the fundamental models of innovation spread. We looked at structure, which was a Bayesian admixture model used for language contact. Last time, we then covered phylogenetic uh, models, and that generated a lot of great discussion. Um, and then uh, we looked at modeling uh, analogical inference in inflectional systems. So at this stage, we're really getting into the linguistic models properly. So um, I'm going to move to today's uh, material, but just in case there are any questions that people didn't fit into last time, because we kind of ran up to the very last section, I'll just pause um, a minute. All right, there'll be time at the end in case you uh, want to ask something there. Great. So um, before we jump into modeling again, I just want to have a prelude and talk a little bit about morphology uh, and talk about this concept of morphemes. So, in inflectional systems, um, many of the morphological forms that we see, whether they're suffixes, prefixes, variants of stems, are distributed throughout the system in ways that align nice and neatly with categories that also play a role in, say, the syntax or the semantics or the phonology. So, for instance, um, the English uh, plural S has three allomorphs, so three different forms, and they're distributed throughout the lexicon in various places. Um, so we've got uh, a syllabic one, is, we've got voiceless and voice, and the distribution of those three allomorphs lines up perfectly well with categories that are in the phonology. Um, so we find the first one after sibilance, we find that the second one comes after any other voiceless segments, and the last one comes after any other voice ones. So the distribution of these is, is lining up perfectly with, with phonology. Um, similarly, uh, I'll 
grab Swedish again. Here are some paradigms of uh, strong verbs in Swedish. We notice that these verbs have multiple stem variants and the distribution of those um, lines up very nicely with the syntax and the semantics of tense and finiteness in uh, Swedish. So we've got this nice alignment between how the forms are distributed uh, morphologically and other categories that are already doing some work elsewhere in the grammatical system. But the distribution of morphological forms is not always like this. It's not always in alignment with some other category that you can establish on independent grounds. So not infrequently, uh, morphological distributions are autonomous. Uh, that is, they don't line up with categories elsewhere in the grammar, but instead they systematically follow their own pattern. So we find a pattern that's not lining up with something else, and we find it systematically again and again and again within that language. Um, and these systematic autonomous patterns are sometimes referred to as morphemes. Now, here's a famous one um, that's found across uh, Romance languages, exemplified here uh, by Spanish. Now, at a first glance, when you, you see something like this, where the pattern is not aligning with uh, uh, syntax or whatever, you might think, well, that's irregularity. We know about that. That happens in language. Why are you bothering me with this? But it's more interesting than that. Morphomes, um, and there is research that's argued this at length, uh, have a life of their own. So historically, they can persist for very long periods, thousands of years while other parts of the grammar rise and fall, the morphomes stay there. Um, and historically, um, not only can they persist, but other idiosyncrasies that arise through various historical processes often get absorbed into the morphomic pattern. So we have some idiosyncrasy that happens because of some little quirk, and it's not in the morphomic pattern. We often see those idiosyncrasies being reshaped into the morphomic pattern. And this active role uh, in shaping language change has been taken as strong evidence in support of a hypothesis that, cognitively speaking, morphomes somehow are explicitly represented in the minds of speakers. Um, now, morphomes also come in a, a number of types, morphomes uh, that involve an autonomous distribution across a paradigm like this uh, are called metamorphomes. Uh, rhizomorphomes um, involve autonomous uh, distributions across the lexemes of languages. Uh, in fact, though, this is just another name for something that we've already discussed, uh, which is inflection classes. But here, this name is emphasizing the fact that this is also a kind of morpheme. This is a, an autonomous pattern. Uh, so for instance, you might have noticed as I flashed these up in previous uh, seminars that these Swedish inflection classes definitely do not pattern with the phonology. So it was not by chance that I choose roots that are school, idol, school, and they're in the three different inflection classes, simply us, bus, plus in the three different inflection classes. So phonology is not going to explain them. Semantics doesn't explain them. Uh, nothing else about their uh, syntax explains them. Again, there are autonomous patterns. Um, and again, um, rhizomorphomes uh, can exist historically for an exceedingly long time, for millennia. Um, other minor idiosyncratic patterns that arise over time are often absorbed into these uh, morphomic patterns. And once again, this active role that they seem to play during language change has been taken as compelling evidence in support of the hypothesis that these morphemes also are explicitly related in the minds of speakers. That's what I wanted to say about morphemes before we get going with the, the modeling today. Oh no, there was one more thing. So morphemes are, are nice, and I've, I've told you why uh, uh, many of us believe that they're important. At the same time, though, they present a real puzzle. They're not easy to uh, sort of fit into how you think language works. We know that they exist in human languages. They persist through time. But having morphemes in your language means you have to learn them. And if you've ever learned a second language, you know that learning all of those inflection classes is a large part of your job. Um, it surely is as uh, a first language uh, learner as well. So you have to learn them. Um, and that must come at some cost to the language learner. And despite that cost, it's not at all clear that they provide any positive benefit to the speaker relative to having a language without them. 
Um, so can we actually explain why they exist and why they persist over time? Uh, this is a, a real problem that I don't think has been solved yet, and I'm going to have a try at it today using models. All right, so for the rest of the, the seminar, my question is going to be, can we evolve morphomes in the lab? Um, that is to say, using simple models. Um, and why would you even ask that kind of question? Well, the question, the real question, of course, is can we gain insights into morphomes in the wild uh, and possibly uh, the dynamics of their emergence, their possible dynamics um, and subsequent stability after they've emerged? Um, and so in order to try and do that, I'm going to discuss here uh, two models of inflection evolution, compare them and see what we find. And that will take me the first hour and then we'll have a break. Um, and then in the second hour, um, having obtained some results about the evolution of morphomes, I'm going to turn to the matter of interpretation, interpreting what it is that I've got from my model, which as we'll see is a rather intricate um, an interesting matter. Uh, and that will take another hour to go through. And then we'll be done. Yeah. Can I ask you, well, make, make a general remark before getting to, yes. into the details? So, so um, well, this strikes me seeing this presented today. So, 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 that you, so, do we have compelling evidence that the, well, so, yeah, so what, what is the evidence we would need? Uh, about the uh, prevalence of morphomes that would show that that there's a problem that they exist and they persist, right? You mean the cross linguistic? Yeah. So, so prevalence. Well, because well, so we we don't really have that. So we don't really have a quantitative typology of what morphological factors there are in the biology of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, well, if you just assumed that, um, yeah, things like phonological change can lead to patterns that used to be well behaved um, becoming less well behaved. And if you assume, so we discussed earlier together, Ron Malouf's policy that um, language morphology can be complex. Because why not, right? Because it doesn't really hurt. Because it's not really hard to remember all these uh, all these things. Uh, then that that in itself predicts that you should have some amount of morphemic behavior uh, in the biology of the world, right? Indeed. So yeah. let's see if we can model it. Let's see what happens when we think we've got a model of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the kind of question. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the prevalence, yeah, it's um, we don't have a yeah. great typology of and you know, an index of your old mm -hmm. morphomes and where you can find them, the number to call yeah. on. Um, Borja asked this um, mm -hmm. dissertation from a couple of years ago as a first step towards that, where he catalogs, was it a hundred odd languages with morphomic patterns with a kind of a rough way of detecting them. Mm -hmm. Not as watertight as you'd want, but then again, when you're doing typology with a hundred languages, there's some give and take there. Yeah. yeah. Um, For example, the L shape that we yeah. saw in one of them, yeah. it's super common, right? <laughs> well, it's super yeah. common in Roman language. Yeah. So, so it, so it, 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 arguably it, it has an inner single origin yeah. in, in so, Roman language. So, yeah. so the fact that it's super common in that corner of the typology that happens to be super well documented, because we have all these great dialectology and historical linguistics of Roman languages. Kind of, yeah, might push us to over interpret the importance of the yeah, uh, so it, of phenomenon. That, that's that's the, that, that's, that's the way that I have as somebody who has worked extensively on exactly these Roman problems. <laughs> so it arose kind of once. Mm -hmm. um, the the question with the with that is why did it stick around, yeah. right? So much else has changed in romance, right? Mm -hmm. And why has this stuck around so well in so many of the romance languages for so long? <laughs> That's um, part of the, the difficulty. And so your questions are good, but they're setting up um, what we'll see. The reason I'm gonna do two models is because the first one will start off looking great and then suddenly it won't quite do what we want to do. Okay, any other questions about more poems before we go. Okay, that's a pretty 
light reception of morphos. Sometimes it's more of an argument. Um, okay, um, so just again, a, a little comment on the use of models as a, a tool for understanding morphomes. Of course, I'll be repeating a lot of what I've said, but now we're going to make it specific to morphomes. So we want to understand morphomes. And if we want to understand morphomes, why would you use models to do it? Why would, don't you just go out and do the typology? Um, so as we've discussed in earlier seminars, models have uh, the benefits of simplicity, which you derive through idealization, which is to say like, they have few moving parts and for each of those parts, you know what they are, uh, and we can control them in a lot of detail. We can observe them without ambiguity, which is really hard to do if you're doing a comparative study, if you don't have documentation over the last 2,000 years for everything that you wanted, don't have the full typology. So models give us these benefits that we don't necessarily get when we're using real empirical data. Um, and all of these properties tend to enhance the degree to which it's clear what's going on um, in the model. And in the last seminar, I took us uh, through the kind of diversity of analogical models that's out there. I mentioned some of the difficulties of interpretation uh, that arise as a consequence of the many, many differences between them. And at the end of last uh, seminar, I kind of advocated a path of uh, progress with these models of idealization and then followed by some sort of controlled de-idealization step by step so that at each stage we understand what we've changed, what effect that has on the results so that we get an idea of what's doing what, because that's the kind of thing we should be able to do. With models. Um, so in the spirit of that aim, um, today I'm going to talk about two very, very simple models of analogy. Um, uh, and in fact, to loop back around to an idea from the first seminar, I would regard the models that we're about to see as exploratory models. They are so simple that we know that they're wrong. They're definitely missing important parts, but they're nevertheless going to be useful as we try and tease out some uh, ideas. They, what they are good for is asking uh, these how possibly questions. So questions like, could the combination of this and that lead to something else under some conceivable circumstances? Um, and indeed, the adventure that we're about to go on is asking exactly this. Can we get the magical ingredients to do the alchemy so that if I put a little bit of this and a little bit of this, I get more bonus. So let's see how we go. As we do this, of course, there are going to be limitations to the method that I'm using. Models have the benefits of simplicity and idealization. They also have the limitations of simplicity and idealization. Um, and so they're going to lack much of what's present in real languages. Um, and therefore, um, we should be completely clear, perhaps they lack exactly the phenomena that are the true keys to understanding what I'm trying to study. Uh, that's a real limitation. Moreover, even when they do contain um, uh, something that's uh, represented in the world, they may correspond imperfectly to it. Uh, and in this study, it almost surely is the case that that's going to be true. Languages are immensely complex. The human mind is immensely complex. And I'm going to have a tiny little simple model uh, that's not going to capture all that detail. Uh, so consequently, models may be partly misleading and therefore careful interpretation is needed. And so I'll do that uh, as well as best I can. So let's begin on this quest. Can we evolve morphomes in the lab? So this, this section of the talk uh, for this hour is going to describe work together with Louise Isha and uh, Sasha Benjamin. And I'll start with a model of rhizomorphomes of inflection classes, which has been an inspiration for our work, and that's Ackman and Maluk 2015. Um, so one way to characterize uh, their study was that it was about orderliness and predictability in inflection systems. So uh, for instance, here's a very abstract representation of uh, the piece of inflection system of Swedish that we've seen a lot of. I talked about these representations at the end uh, last time, but we've just got a, a distinct uh, index for each of the uh, uh, exponents that were in uh, those columns. Now, what we know is that across languages, um, inflection systems are orderly, or to put it another way, they're much less chaotic than potentially they could be given the materials that they have to use. So for instance, in language after language, we see them looking something like this diagram here and not like 
anti-Swedish here, where I'm using the same exponents, but in a completely chaotic way. That's not what languages look like. So um, we get uh, order and predictability in collection systems, and Akram and Maluk were concerned about that. So this orderliness and predictability has benefits. Um, it makes language more predictable. And as I mentioned uh, last time, that helps adult speakers in the production of forms that they have never heard. Um, and it simplifies learning when you're uh, acquiring the language. So orderliness is observed and it's useful if you have it. But how do you get the orderliness in the first place? Um, why are systems orderly to begin with? It's a nice place to be, but why are you there? How did you get there? Um, and so Ackerman and Maloof pose that question in this way. So suppose that inflectional systems change over time according to some simple historical mechanism. And suppose that this evolutionary dynamic spontaneously leads to orderliness. For that to be true, what could that simple mechanism be? Uh, and this is a classic how possible, how possibly question. Is there a way that we could see that it's possible for to get uh, orderliness emerging spontaneously? And the mechanism that they consider is speakers inferring the contents of paradigm cells. Um, and they build an evolutionary model of that mechanism, and then they examine its diachronic consequences and look for orderliness emerging spontaneously. So the model is this. Suppose we have an inflection system, and the lexemes here are in low rows, like I was doing with my Swedish diagram. The paradigm cells are in columns. And at each evolutionary step, we're going to take one cell of one lexeme, marked here with a question mark, and we're going to infer the exponent that's in that cell. And the inferential process is going to look like this. To start from where you are, look at some other cell in the same lexeme, and then compare that cell's contents to all the other lexemes in the system. When other lexemes match, then they're going to become lexemes of interest. Select one of them at random. And then in that lexeme, go back to the original cell, examine its contents, and take the exponent for filling uh, the original cell. And that's their little model. It is a model of analogy. Uh, and it's as simple as that. And that's their mechanism. Um, so they then run that over and over again, and they ask, how does this evolutionary model perform? So let's have a look. Here's our lexicon. I've got 100 lexemes, all nice and flat in the rows. I've got eight paradigm cells uh, in the columns and uh, six different exponents per cell, and the colors are giving you an idea of what the different exponents are. And we're starting with a very chaotic system. Uh, we begin with the exponents distributed randomly, and then we're going to what we're going to do is repeat this inference mechanism over and over and ask what happens to the system as we do this. Right, and that's why they've published it. Um, so as we repeat this inference mechanism over and over again, the system self-organizes. And in fact, it continues getting more and more orderly until every lexeme in that language now has the same pattern of exponents. And they started from absolute chaos because that's the kind of worst situation you could start from. And if you apply this thing, you just get more orderly. If you start halfway through the process where it's fairly orderly, you get more orderly. And that's how it works. So what's most important here is that in this model, we move towards orderliness. Um, and that move towards orderliness is not stipulated. So the evolutionary steps are not defined as increase orderliness. Rather, orderliness is an emergent property uh, when the system changes according to a really simple exponent inference mechanism um, that they described. So this provides one answer to the how possibly question, is it possible for orderliness to arise from um, an exponent inference mechanism? And the answer is yes. Under the right circumstances, it seems it's possible. Um, now, let me ask another question about their model. Do inflection classes emerge? 
And I'd say, no, not really, not in the sense that we'd normally think about them, not stable inflection classes. So although the system uh, passes briefly through a stage uh, of organization that you might say looks like inflection classes, um, it reaches that stage not because that's any particular destination that it's headed towards, uh, but rather that's a stage that it has to pass through in order to go from complete chaos to complete orderliness. But there's nothing in between where it rests for a while and says, oh, look, I've got five inflection classes. This is great. I'll just stay like this for the next 2,000 years before I go to complete orderliness. No, it just rushes past them. Um, so if your question is, um, do we see here how possibly you could have stable, persistent inflection classes emerge from a simple exponent in, uh, inference, then the answer at this stage is no. So, Sasha and Louise and I attempted to evolve some stability. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understood the emerging of the inflection classes. That's the model, the prediction, or is that what we see in language? Um, whether like new and more inflection classes in languages. Right. So, um, the hypothesis is all happening within simplified model world, right? Okay, so there's going to be a, a whatever we find, there's going to be some sort of process of interpretation to then relate that back to the target system, which is real languages, right? Um, where, why we're doing this at all is it's not a random uh, experiment. The idea is that we know that real languages undergo analogical change. We've got a model that only uses analogical change and repeats it over and over again and asks what is the outcome of doing that? And in the model, what we find is it moves to this complete orderliness that tidies up the system. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't do, as I was pointing out, is give you inflection classes that hang around for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, so because we thought we could do chaos, um, um, even the inflection classes that we see emerge might be really catchy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe they have the same exponent in one cell, but they'll have different with another cell. And so, um, like, given that I didn't really understand what the um, how how you determine the 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 other lexemes of interest, mm -hmm. you know, given we have a form A in another cell, yeah, what are the the other lexemes that uh, behave the same way? Mm -hmm. So if if in the other cells it's patchy, then there's going to be some uh, there might be some leveling out, and so like uh, inflection classes bleeding into one another, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, perhaps I'm, I'm wondering if you start with uh, clearly defined inflection classes, uh, does do you still end up with a completely uniform system? Yeah, right. So um, uh, let me take it in steps. So the the question that you had about um, Classes bleeding into one another. Yes, that definitely happens. That's why they will wash out and all become the same. I'll come to that point in a little bit. Um, and then the the question of what happens if you start not from chaos but from a system that has a certain number um, of inflection classes. So that's a, a really good question, and that's um, and there are other ways that you would add additional questions to that. Um, and uh, a colleague of ours, um, Andrea Sims kind of looks at that question when she and I have gotten together, we've put it on our list in the future um, to have a look at what happens if you start not from chaos, but from various ways that existing inflectional systems could have various relationships between one another. So it's a really good question. It's on our to-do list, but I haven't systematically done it yet. So, yeah. But it's, Thanks. yeah, it's obviously a sensible question. Um, the, the idea of starting from chaos was that this was supposed to be the worst case. And if you could get uniformity from that, then you could get uniformity from everything. But that's not necessarily going to be true because perhaps you're charting some path from chaos to uniformity that actually doesn't go past some of the states that real languages might be in. Um, so it's a good place to start. Chaos is a great, if you're going to start anywhere, start there. Um, but you're right. There's other questions that you would ask as well. And I'm, I won't ask them today. So ask for your patience. Yeah. So 
But can we can we get things if we're starting from chaos? Can we get some inflection classes to arise that then stay there stably? So the three of us tried giving the inference mechanism a few extra things to work with and see what happens. So we gave it first uh, an enhanced supply of evidence to work with. Uh, that is, we got uh, the little inference makers or speakers to look at uh, more of the inflection system before deciding how to fill a cell. So for example, we got them to look at multiple evidence lexemes at once before deciding how to fill that cell. Um, and then they should look at them, look at what the decisions would be, weigh it up somehow and, and do that. Um, we also got them to look at multiple other uh, cells, right? So if you go to, the first step is you go to another cell, well, do that with multiple different ones and ask what the conclusion is by doing that, weigh it up and um, make your decision that way. If we did that, well, the outcome was that the orderliness emerged even quicker and inflection classes still all disappeared entirely from the system and we went to complete uniformity. So we got a result, not the one that we were uh, asking whether we could get so far. We then also tried de-idealizing the model with more realistic frequencies of items. So in real language, different lexemes and different paradigm cells occur with different frequencies. Um, the most frequent being far overrepresented and the least frequent being um, you know, exceedingly rare. So we added frequency dif differences. Uh, technically, we implemented that with a Zipian distribution for both lexemes of the cells so that low frequency items were more likely to undergo change. High frequency items were more likely to furnish the evidence uh, on which you made that change. And the outcome here was a little kind of closer to what we had hoped for in some ways. We got more rapid orderliness. Um, we still got a rapid loss of nearly all of the inflection classes, but we did get a somewhat delayed uh, attainment of um, total unit. Oops. Keep getting thrown into Zoom. Uh, a somewhat delayed attainment of total uniformity, but only because there's this fact that some forms very, very rarely change. So we have to sort of around waiting for them to change. Right, they change uniformity. So what we basically get is complete uniformity of almost everything except for the really slow ones and eventually they change, which doesn't really look like a normal inflection class system. Um, all right, so so far I've focused on inflection classes and I'm gonna to return to them in a couple of minutes. But first let me switch to another question that we have. And that is, can we evolve metamorphones? This is like the pattern that I showed you uh, in Spanish, the kind that are most famously known from Romans. And so here we started with uh, a model by Louise Isha in 2015. And in this model, the inference uh, mechanism for choosing a stem variant in various cells of the paradigm works like this. So again, we have a cell that we want to fill. We want to know which stem variant to put in there. We choose another uh, cell and we note uh, which stem is used there. Then we pick another lexeme. This is our evidence lexeme. Uh, and we look at its stems in the same two cells. And if uh, the stems in the evidence lexeme in those two cells are identical, then we'll just copy across and make those two identical uh, there. On the other hand, if the two cells in the evidence lexeme that we're looking at are different, then we'll just copy at random in order to fill uh, the, the cell there. So that's uh, uh, Isha's model from 2015. And does that lead to the emergence of metamorphosis, which is what she was trying to do? Uh, you can put your money down and then I'll reveal the answer. Um, so here's a typical uh, model run. And no, no, all of the cells in every lexeme just have the same step variant. We've lost all of the variation, our morphomes have died. So like in the inflection class model where the inflection class has all disappeared here, the metamorphomes uh, all disappeared. However, suppose we now change the mechanism just so slightly. So in the second condition, uh, which is where the, the two cells of the evidence lexeme differ, let's say that the response is not to choose a stem variant at random, but rather attends to the fact that we're dealing with difference here. 
So the stem that we should choose, whatever we choose, is a different one. Anything so long as it's different to the X. And the notion here is that in the first condition, we're attending to similarity, and in the second, we're attending to difference. Okay, so does this mechanism lead to the emergence of metamorphomes? Again, you can put down your money. Uh, let's see how we go, and we'll run it. Yes, it does. So every lexeme has divided its cells arbitrarily somehow into some that go this way and some that go that way. Uh, and not only does it evolve metamorphomes, but it evolves stable ones, which will sit there uh, and stay. They're not merely fleeting temporary on the path to uniformity. These ones um, settle in and persist. So uh, that having been said, we did find that for morphomes to emerge, the conditions need to be rather favorable to them. Uh, so you wanna have the temperature just right, the humidity right. Um, in this run, when the inference is made, um, it's based on, I said we made comparisons with multiple lexemes and multiple cells. This is with making a comparison with 80% of the other lexemes in order to make your decision. Um, if we drop that figure even just a little bit to comparing 60% of the other lexemes as your evidence lexemes before adding it all up and making your final decision, the system can actually struggle to reach stability. You can see it's almost, come on, come on, come on, come on. It just never quite gets to the final stability. So it's really sensitive to the condition. So we should uh, acknowledge that uh, as part of uh, what the finding was. Moreover, if we tilt the system sensitivity so that during decision-making, it places more weight on similarity or more weight on dissimilarity, then the results can also change. So in the animations that I just showed you, similarity and dissimilarity were treated with equal weight. However, if similarity is given twice the rate of dissimilarity, then the instability continues for a while. It's all looking good. And then at some point, it all collapses. So that's if we're giving similarity greater weight. Um, and here's on the other side, if we give dissimilarity twice the weight of similarity, here we seem to get close, but it just keeps shifting around and it just never settles down. Um, so let me summarize a little bit what we got uh, here. So have we found something about evolving stability? We think we found something. Um, so I'm going to frame this in terms of uh, the idea of forces of attraction and repulsion. So in Ackerman and Maloof's model, lexemes at every single step, um, the only thing that happens to them is that lexemes, which were already similar in one way or another, become more similar in another way. So they're already similar in one way. The only thing that happens is they become more similar. That is, we have a system of interacting objects, and in this system of objects, only one force is acting on them, and that is a force of attraction. So eventually, everything ends up converging with everything else, leading to inflectional uniformity. Now, you can tinker with the frequencies and you can change all sorts of little parameters, but that doesn't change the fundamental fact that the dynamic in this system is attraction only. And that's why when we tried all these bells and whistles, we still get the same result. It will end in complete convergence. Make sure I keep my voice. In our morpheme evolution model, at every single step, there were two things that could happen. Stems in pairs of cells either became more similar to one another, which is a force of attraction, or they specifically became dissimilar, which is a force of repulsion. Um, and this sets up a particular dynamic within any given lexeme. So we have one group of cells that are mutually attracting one another, and a second group of cells that are mutually attracting one another as well, but between the groups, they're repelling one another. Um, and moreover, because the decision to attract and repel is made through a comparison with other lexemes, these groups will tend to align across the lexemes in the system. Um, and that's how we, we end up getting the, the result that we get. However, it's not obvious that these two forces will 
lead you to this perfect, lovely equilibrium. Um, in terms of the outcomes of uh, evolutionary processes, if all the lexemes align nice and quickly, this is fine. We're going to get nice, stable morphemes because everyone's got into their own columns. They're repelling each other. They're repelling the other guys, but mutually reinforcing one another. But if different groups of lexemes through the lexicon have different arrangements, then their patterns are actually going to compete with one another. Uh, and then so we're going to tug other lexemes this way and that. And so we get this uh, instability going on. So when this thing happens, uh, it seems that the outcome can be really sensitive to the inferences that, you, that are being made. So if those decisions tilt in favor of um, similarity, then smaller islands of similarity tend to grow. And at some point, the morphemes collapse together. If the decisions tilt in favor of dissimilarity, then these distinct little groups of cells, um, they continue to exist, but they keep stealing from one another and shifting uh, the boundaries around, which is why the system seems to stay restless and uh, always uh, moving around. So um, I've talked about, yeah. Can I just ask a question about, about that, that last point? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oops. <coughs> this one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this one. Sorry, I'm pushing the wrong button. That's all. Yeah, so this one. Yeah. So isn't this empirically what we find? That they keep moving around? Well, that the same, that, that within one language, you get multiple patterns, of, multiple distributions of standard multi. Yeah. And and some amount of moving around mm -hmm. uh, of the scenes you've been in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a, a nice question. So if you recall, the, the, the stable state that I evolved was all of the lexemes yeah. had exactly the same morphoming pattern. That is not what we get in real uh, language. Um, and that's, so like I was emphasizing, you know, your models will produce things, but they'll miss stuff that's in the real world. That's something where our model is currently unrealistic. Yeah, um, and the the question about isn't it true that in the real world things keep moving around? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the yes, setting is not so bad. The, the setting where things yeah. keep moving is is a realistic one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Just quick question. You said that there were two groups of um, cells that separated from one another. Yeah. But the the way the algorithm works does not preclude. Three or more. That's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So what I what I found so this would require doing some really systematic testing of varying all of the parameters, right? But um, the number of regions that emerge depends on the number of cells, the number of exponents, the exact uh, uh, balance that you do. So um, we've kind of got this this thing, and it does stuff. And it's cool, but as you tweak the dials, it's really not clear. It, it, they interact in quite a nonlinear way. Yeah. So there's a lot of work to do to sort of understand what's going on. Um, and at this point, what I'll do is stick with what I've shown you because there's already going to be enough uh, to discuss. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, it doesn't have to be two. Okay, so. Uh, the the thing the model that I was showing you was uh, evolving metamorphomes like the the romance ones, but can this also be applied to rhizomorphomes to inflection classes? Well, yes, it can. Um, and the key here is to <laughs> create a revised mechanism for inflection class, uh, which introduces into the picture two forces: uh, um, attraction and repulsion. So here's how it's going to work: we look at another cell, uh, we compare with other lexemes, and then this time we're going to keep track of both matching lexemes and differing lexemes. Last time we only looked at the matching ones. Then we're going to come back to the original cell as before, and the exponents that are in the matching lexemes are going to induce attraction. So the more X's we see there, the more likely our decision is to be X. And um, in addition to that, the differing lexemes will now induce repulsion. So the more X's we see in there, the less likely we are to choose X as our solution. And if we plug that in and run it, uh, we start from complete randomness. 
the system self-organizes, and this time, it preserves a small number of distinct inflection classes. So these are groups of lexemes that have different exponents to one another in their cells. Um, and I won't go into too much detail here, but as you would imagine, like in the metamorphome model, the outcome here will depend in very delicate ways on the exact balance between attraction and repulsion. So you can apply it and have everything disappear. You can apply it and have things remain in an unstable state. All right, so at this juncture, let me just summarize um, these ideas about uh, evolving morphomes. So the, the key that we've found so far, and there are many years to go and build more uh, uh, models, but at this point, um, it looks like one of the keys to evolving morphomes uh, within this little simplified modeling world is to have two forces. The first is a force of attraction, this is easy to understand. The force of attraction is uh, a preference for similarity. It is what people have always assumed analogy is about. It is look at something similar and become similar to it. That's analogy has always been assumed to be uh, about similarity uh, and becoming similar like that. However, uh, left on its own, this force of attraction creates only convergence and uniformity in the long run uh, to evolve Morphomes, we need a balancing force of repulsion, and together the two forces um, enable uh, stable distinctions to arise and persist. Um, and this balancing uh, force of repulsion um, arises in our model due to our treatment now of dissimilarity during the inference process, um, namely that uh, if lexemes are dissimilar to one another in one cell of the paradigm, um, then they're favored to be dissimilar in another cell of the paradigm. All right, that's nice. We got things to work when we make that assumption, um, but it does leave a kind of question, why would you treat dissimilarity like that anyway? Um, there's you know hundreds of years of research on analogy and that's not how people did it. Um, so to answer that question, why do we treat dissimilarity that way is gonna, Bring me back to the topic of cognition uh, and what is our model of analogy and what's going on there. Um, and questions about cognition are also going to raise all kinds of interesting questions about how we would interpret what I've just shown you here as we try and relate it back to the real world or to minds of uh, speakers. Um, and so I'll take an extended look at these uh, cognitive questions when I continue into the, the second hour after a break. Now I'll if there's more questions, let's deal with that and then take a break and come back to answer these. Yeah. Uh, I, I have another question, um, which is uh, the following. So another thing, yeah, well, yeah, I see the point of putting impulsion in, uh, but uh, so suppose that instead of, so have you, have you played with the idea of instead of doing that route, Putting another force for change in the system, so putting something like phological change uh, as a simultaneous thing that happens in the system. Yeah. So um, again, it's on the shopping list, right? Um, and one of the reasons why we didn't rush to it immediately is because it requires a lot more thought and argument um, to explain why your model of Chronological change is is plausible, yeah. but here's the other thing: um, when you've only got one force of um, convergence, even if you disrupt the system with phonological change, it's going to keep. The only thing it will do immediately after you've done that disruption is head back towards um, <laughs> uniformity. So what it won't do is you disrupt the system with sound change and it says, oh, thank you, you gave me some more phones. I'll just keep them for a thousand years. If we know that it won't do that, it will immediately eat away at them. Um, but I'm just saying, you know, this is what will happen, but uh, we haven't done the models to yeah. see what surprising things arise out of it. Yeah, it's on the list. So things that are kind of on our list are something that emulates sound change, which we know is one of the things that gives rise to um, uh, morphomes or other kinds of changes that impact part of the lexicon and not another part, which <clears throat> then creates some sort of partition of it, which is morphomes. 
doing that. Um, interesting questions like what would happen if you have infusion of borrowing? So sometimes that also creates uh, different lexical classes, right? Um, a, a few things like that. So we've got a kind of laundry list and we what we're trying to do uh, is, is go through them sort of one step at a time. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I welcome other suggestions of you know, what's missing here, yeah. It, uh, it's not a suggestion, it's just uh, I'm trying to clarify for myself to understand. So I I think of um, the, I, I think of two uh, dynamic systems. Uh, one would be uh, morphological and one would be chronological. And uh, uh, you're, are you trying at some point to see how they in parallel uh, possibly um, work and interact with one another? Um, and this, this is what uh, Olivia's question is driving at. Yeah, yeah, right. And in that question, um, so from my view of dynamic system from the point of view of speech, um, there is a um, perturbator. There is always a perturbator that triggers a um, new realm. And, and I think that um, phonological change, sound change can or it can serve as perturbator in one case on the morphological side, but it could also be in the opposite uh, in the opposite direction, right? Mm, it's, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so also um, from the point of view of um, of speech, there's this idea that um, um, uh, stability is not necessarily um, an ideal state. It's better to think of it uh, as a as a target as a goal, but by French evolutionarily, uh, systems are not. Uh, uh, there's no advantage to to finding uh, uh, a stable state and staying in it. Um, and if you add to the list of advantages, you add adaptability. Then you want to have a system that is just barely close. Just that doesn't change it so that it stays. Yeah. Um, right. So there's a lot there. Nobody has done it with it. Yeah, yeah. It's there. So there's a lot there. I, I know that the arguments for the benefits of being close to a stable state but not exactly there are often tied to the notion that there's some kind of fitness value, right? Uh, that there's, there's some sort of advantage to have as being in this state versus this state. One of the mysteries with morphomes is it's not what value you get from them, right? It's not like having an organized phonological system, which makes it easy to learn. It's better just to not have more phones. I mean, that, that's easier to learn, right? It's just a, a weight that you have to carry. Once you have to carry it, you'd like it to be nice and orderly as much as possible, right? So there's a reason why a system should tend towards orderliness, um, right? Um, but why not just get rid of them all? And in real language, we, we see that they don't they're just so persistent. So the, the one of the, the questions that we're after is persistence. Now, the, the question about um, uh, a, an equilibrium point being something that you go towards, but you don't actually reach, absolutely. Um, our model is so simple that it goes to the, the equilibrium point, right? Which is what a lot of simple models do. They hit the equilibrium, but then once you bring in more reality to the models, there are these perturbation forces which keep you away, such as sound change always doing something to move the morphological change doing something, lexical borrowing doing something. So absolutely, what we're showing here is um, the, the that analogy by itself, without all of the other perturbating forces, right? Perturbating, perturbing um, forces will get you to complete uniformity if you use Ackerman Maloof's model. It can get you to this kind of partitioned lexi uh, le lexicon or, or morphone uh, state if you're using our model. But of course, we don't have any of those additional factors that are constantly perturbing it, uh, which would keep it away from that. And so it's an open question. If you introduce them, would this behavior disappear or would it remain looking in a sort of realistic kind of state like language? Uh, yeah. Bethel has a question online. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Hi, Eric. Um, can you hear me? Okay, um, so this was, uh, I have a question about the uh, Akmal uh, Manouf model, uh, uh, because if you, inflection classes may, well, at, certainly at times, also help to signal, uh, or membership help, uh, may help to signal 
uh, lexical identity. So uh, did you look at into how lexical identity or ambiguity might have been raised by that model? So basically removing inflection class distinctions basic, so, so that different lexemes then turn out to uh, become one. So yeah. basically, that the paradigms distinguish uh, anymore between the uh, um, um, between two yeah. different things. I get what you're saying. So let's imagine a in a simplified world, we have uh, a stem, and it's identical in these two lexemes. But one of them is in inflection class one, and one is in inflection class two. So we're still able to easily know which lexeme we're dealing with, right? So in their model and in ours, it's it, the representation is so simple that the only thing that's represented is those little exponent indices. There's nothing about stems or roots, and and therefore that that kind of possibility doesn't arise. And it wasn't a question that they were asking. Um, but the the more generally the question that you're asking is something that Sasha is very interested in and is and is doing research on at the moment. Um, so it's it's linked to this, and you can see ways that this kind of model could be de-idealized to make that a question. Likewise, um, chime in again, Berthold, if, if I haven't fully answered the question, by the way. Um, likewise, another de-idealization we could do is actually have words that have strings or segments. Um, that's gonna, that will behave somewhat differently to this hyper-idealized world where all you've got to do is keep track of, you know, a set of exponents. Um, and if you were going to do something like introducing sound change into the model, I'd be more comfortable doing it with something that has something like segments because you could be more reliably sure that you could simulate something that is realistically like sound change rather than imagining what sound change should look like in the hyper-simplified world of just <laughs> exponent indices. Um, and of course, there's, there, there's good discussion uh, in the literature around why you should not stop with exponents in industry, uh, indices. They they give you a certain view of the world that may not be the best one to have. Uh, there's more complexity there. Yeah, just uh, just as a comment, I was uh, wondering whether basically the, the repulsion uh, could be related to something like uh, a speaker's naive ambiguity management. So um, there have been studies in Paris at the Sony labs uh, using robots and shown basically for the transition from old high German to uh, 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 modern high German. This is a study by Remy van Treib uh, that where the modern high German has massive syncretism in, in, in the paradigms and the old high German does not. Uh, since at the phrasal level, there was a sort of no increase uh, in, uh, in ambiguity. So the more syncretic paradigms uh, were functionally superior because uh, uh, fewer forms had to be distinguished by the speakers. So that mm -hmm. could be something like expressiveness and, and ambiguity management. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and so in the second hour, I'll talk about some other things that might be coming into this, but um, since you raise it now, um, if you can hold many things in your mind at once. In the next hour, I'll show you some reasoning about why you should actually do this, why it's rational to do it. But what I won't mention explicitly there is that at an abstract level, the kind of rationality that we're talking about has been shown in lab experiments to be something that humans do when you give them certain kinds of ambiguity tests. Right, it's basically I give you something that could be A or B, uh, and then so that's what you start with. Then I show you that um, it is compatible with A, and what humans then do is go, oh, so it's not compatible with B, even though that's logically not the thing that you would do. Um, under certain ways of reasoning, it can be shown that with Bayesian reasoning, that is a reasonable thing to do. And people have been shown in laboratories to do that. The kind of thing that I'm going to walk through at the start of the next hour is a more elaborate version of that. But at its absolute basis, it is about this kind of um, uh, reasoning under uncertainty with ambiguity. Um, so, yeah, I, I can I agree. Yeah. Should we take a break now? Oh, no, one more? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about one thing that you said five minutes ago, namely that the inflectional classes are pretty persistent. Yeah, I believe 
to be true. Uh, and I, I saw some small study by Oncheck that looked like on the difference of the nominal suffixes like between the 14th century and now and the syllable change is pretty. But I wonder if it's like if there is a social social linguistics aspect to it in respect to how much multi multicultural the the culture is and whether we see more change in these kind of contexts in countries where there's more contact with them. Yeah, sure. Right. So um if we assume so we've we've all agree that it's quite a learning cost to learning these things well, right? If particularly if you're an adult second language learner, you might not do as well as a first language learner. Um, over time, if there are enough of those people in the community, that can lead to changes towards the simplification of the systems. Um, yeah, that's certainly one dynamic that could lead to them um, collapsing. Yeah. The question is more, yeah, I see that it's a logical way to go, but do we see that in countries with more language contact that inflectional classes disappear more quickly? Do you know? I believe so. I'm not an expert on language contact, but that kind of complexity is one of the things that I, I believe is something that can be lost easily. Um like like a lot of kinds of idiosyncrasy, um, you know, something that's not really rule governed or sort of minor generalizations can, can get lost in that situation yeah okay good let's take five minutes uh and then i'll start again <laughs> Okay, I should get going so that I uh, can fit everything into the hour. So welcome back again. Um, so in the second half today, let me turn to the topic of interpretation of the model that I've introduced. So first, um, I'll address the question that I raised before the break of why would you treat this similarity in the way that we do in the model? And then I'll move on to uh, some broader cognitive questions that our model uh, raises. So first, let me talk about similarity, dissimilarity, uh, and inference in our model. So recall that in the first hour, I showed you uh, diagrams that look uh, something like this. The uh, rows of lexemes, the columns of cells, and the most elementary comparison that we're doing um, is between um, two cells, and I'm going to label those cells that we're comparing A and B, so I can keep track of them easily, uh, and between two lexemes, uh, one that I've been referring to as the evidence lexeme, and I'll keep calling it that, uh, and the other one which I'll now give a name, I'll call it the focal lexeme, so I can just refer to it easily. Um, and I didn't want to say that quite yet. Um, so the evidence lexeme is providing the evidence for how we fill in the miss missing cell for the focal lexeme. Now, let me walk you through some reasoning. Um, and so uh, summon up the, the caffeine in your uh, bloodstream uh, for a minute. So suppose that cell A has three possible exponents in this language, and I'm just going to label them as one, two, and three. And cell B also has three possible exponents in this language, and I'll label them four, five, and six. So what are all of the possible combinations for a lexeme of an exponent in cell A and an exponent in cell B? This is an easy question to get us started. It's going to be, well, one and four, one and five, one and six, or two and four, two and five, two and six, etc. We got them, right? So um So I'm going to say, oh yeah, so notice that over here in the information that we've got to deal with, we've only got one piece of information about how they actually combine in the language, and that is in the evidence lexeme, where we know what both A and B are. In the focal lexeme, one of them is missing, so we don't have the information about how they can combine there. Um, so we have just one piece of evidence about how they uh, combine. Uh, that's in the evidence lexeme, we're observing both cell A and cell B, uh, and in the focal lexeme, we just have information about cell A 
and not about its combination with cell B. All right, now let's get a little bit more concrete. Let's suppose that the lexeme, uh, we've gone and looked at it, and it has the combination of one and four. Uh, and so now I'm going to write up this little table down here, and I'm going to keep track of the combinations that exist in this language of cell A and cell B. Um, and so we can put a tick in the box because one and four is something that we, we have observed that definitely occurs in the language. We have evidence for that. And now let's continue to suppose, just uh, allow me to do this, continue to suppose that this is all we know, that uh, the possible exponents are one, two, and three in cell A and, one, and four, five, six in cell B. But otherwise, we know nothing about what actually occurs in this language other than this one piece of evidence that we've got here. So that's our base. Next, um, suppose I tell you, oh, in this language, there are only actually three ways that you can combine cell A with cell B. Um, and we already know that one of those combinations is to have one with four. Um, so we've got that. Um, that's what we see in the evidence lexeme. That's why we know that. And now I'm going to ask you, what are the other two possible combinations? And there are only two possible answers to my question. Um, let's take a minute. To, there's a trick to getting the answer. So if you don't get the trick, it will keep on annoying you. If you do get the trick, it'll be really obvious. All right, so at least some people in the room uh, were nodding it immediately. So um, anyone want to tell me what the two possible answers are? Yeah. Um, two, five, and three, six. So we could have a tick here and a tick there. Yeah, or three, five, and six. Or a tick here and a tick here. Great, those are the only two possibilities. And why are they the only two? Um, because we know that we see all of the numbers. On yeah, the exactly. Already yeah, so we can't just go tick, tick here, because then we've got nothing that's showing us exponents five and six, but we know that they're in the system. Right, great. So we've got all of those possibilities. So what we find here, um, these are the answers. Um, so if, now I want to go further. Um, if the focal lexeme, we haven't yet said what's here, but let's say that we now say it. The focal lexeme has um, exponent uh, number one in cell A, then what is in cell B in this scenario that we're talking about? It has to be four. There's, there's no other choice, right? Um, and what if the exponent in the focal cell, uh, in, sorry, in the focal lexeme in cell A, is not number one. What can you tell me about what it is? It's, yeah, it's five or six, or to put another word, it's not four. What we get here is that if the focal cell is the same as the evidence lexeme in cell A, it'll be the same in cell B. And if it's different in cell A, it'll be different in cell B. So here we start to see where this whole thing is emerging from. Now, in the example that I just went through, there were only three possible combinations in the language for the exponents, a combination of exponents in cell A and cell B. And so the result was deterministic. If the evidence lexeme is the, uh, if the evidence lexeme and the focal lexeme are the same in cell A, then they're the same in cell B. If they're different in cell A, then they're different in cell B. If we also consider possibilities where there are more than three combinations allowed in the language, then the outcome will no longer be deterministic, but it remains true that if the evidence lexeme and the focal lexeme are the same in cell A, then the most likely possibility is that they're the same in cell B. <laughs> and uh, if they're different in cell A, the most likely possibility is the same, is that they're different in cell B. And I won't go through all of that because that would take rather long time and um, but if you like this kind of stuff, I encourage you to like show that to yourself uh, at home. And one way to do it is start with a language that has four possible combinations and work out how that works. Um, yeah. Or, you know, and then if you like, go on to the general thing and write the proof and publish it. Um, but, <laughs> or you can try because there's a publication in 
under review at the moment, which hopefully does the same thing already. But what you can see here is you can see where the motivation comes from um, for the inference procedure that we use in our model. Um, I have, uh, so you can see that, and I have one more comment to make about the result. Um, first, let me just, uh, for completeness sake, note that if I say that this language allows all nine possible combinations, then this thing about being more or less likely is no longer true. Everything's equally likely. Uh, but of course, most languages don't allow all possible combinations uh, when you look at the pairs of cells. That's one of the things that helps us learn them and uh, do all the great things that we do with them. All right. So my final comment on, on, on this point uh, is that um, I want to now address the interpretation uh, of this finding of same goes with same and different goes with different. So one interpretation of what I just showed you is that when speakers have to infer an exponent, they're actually running the full statistics. They go, well, there's this many possibilities in the language, and I know that there's this, and I'll put it at the table, and I'll do the ticks, and I'll work out that you know the probability of this is 0.1, but the probability of this is 0.15, so this one wins. One possibility is they're doing all that, and they get the answer. Another interpretation is that speakers don't bother with all of that complication. They just use a simple heuristic, and that is, if the focal and the evidence lexemes are the same in cell A, they're the same in B. And if they're different, then they're different. Um, that would be a lot less demanding computationally to just jump straight to that answer. Um, and, in, um, and the answer would be the same. So you could do it the hard way or you could do it the easy way. So there's are equal interpretations if you think that um, the mechanism is what's going on in people's mind, and then you, these are two routes to which you can you, you can get there. Um, when I was discussing um, Bayesian inference in seminar two, I mentioned this um, notion, which is getting some currency in uh, cognitive science, that humans may use heuristics in order to skip some of the computational uh, demands entailed by full statistical inference. So this is pure speculation here, but perhaps this is one of the heuristics that humans have. Maybe this is something that we evolved as we spoke languages with inflectional systems. Um, this is a shortcut and that helped us be better at morphology. That's pure speculation. I have no evidence for that, but it, it, it would uh, be consistent with what we're, we're looking at here. Either way, what isn't speculation is that if uh, the inference of exponents does apply this same, same, different, different decision process, which we can see is rationally grounded. If it does apply that, then we find that morphomes can emerge spontaneously um, from uh, the process in the diachronic model. And so that's where I'm starting to stitch together what we found in the model to something of an interpretation outside of the model. That's a nice model that you have, but why that one? All right. Now let me pose the question. We've got a nice little story about exponent uh, inferences, but is that is that it? That's the end of the story. Um, that's the full extent of how cognition has anything to say about morphomes. Um, so for me, I'd always found the arguments really quite compelling that morphomes had to be cognitively real. They had to be represented explicitly in the minds of speakers. That's how you get them to do all these cool things uh, with uh, language change. But if you believe the account that I've, been giving you over the, the last hour, I don't need to believe that. I can just let that go. Um, we can account for the presence of morphomes just with exponents in uh, inference plus evolution. Um, and the exponent inference mechanism that we had is defined in such a way that it has no explicit cognitive representation of morphomes. They're not in there. Uh, it just does little comparisons between cells and users of heuristic. So so this is, this is me up here, I believe this stuff. So are people like me wrong? Uh, do morphomes actually have no real cognitive reality? So in the time remaining, I wanna walk through some potential implications uh, of thinking about uh, uh, exponent inference, uh, inference in this way and ask a slightly different question. Let's say that we're on the right track, that this heuristic is, is what we use in order to do the inference, but what would a cognitive system look like which is designed to carry out that process well and support it well. Because we take the assumption that we're doing it, but what would a cognitive system look like that's designed to be the sort of support system? 
for this. So what it's going to look like if we design a cognitive system to support exponent in, uh, inference of the type that I've discussed. So let me now consider some options. And I'm going to go through some bad ones and hopefully get towards some good ones. So system number one, I'm going to call inattentive inference. So Ackerman and Maloof's original model contains uh, an inflectional uh, inference system that performs uh, inattentive inference. Um, so if we frame it in the terminology that I was just using before, it picks one lexeme from the whole lexicon as its evidence lexeme. Any lexeme is fine, so long as the exponent uh, in cell A is the same as the focal cell. And then uh, it just copies cell B uh, from there. Now, in doing this, um, it's considering just one choice of evidence lexeme. So it's missing all of the evidence that it might find here or here or here and in all of the other lexemes of the language. Um, so this is a pretty inattentive way to guess uh, correctly because it's ignoring information that the rest of the lexicon could have provided you when you're making that uh, decision. Uh, moreover, in our models of uh, morpheme evolution, as I was saying, we found that morphomes only evolve actually when the system pays attention to multiple uh, other lexemes and multiple other cells. So this is one cognitive system which could support um, Ackerman Maloof's model, uh, but I'm going to leave it behind um, and assume that we actually have an attentive inference system. Whatever it does, it does attend to multiple other lexemes. Uh, and whatever it does, it probably attends to multiple other cells. So the question now is, well, how do you do that? Now, yeah. Is it really the case that it has to be attentive to multiple things? Or so, so, so couldn't, you know, couldn't a biased selection of these as well you're attending to paying attention Dude, to? Let to me to give my talk. <laughs> let me give my talk. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So, so what I want to do is get to that point and we'll run through some sort of steps on the way. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. So before we get to the, the conclusion, <laughs> let me go to the next step. So let's have an attentive system, but I'm going to call it the attentive but woeful inference system. And this is to pick an exponent. This system does look at multiple other lexemes and multiple other cells. Um, so it's attentive. And in fact, what it's going to do is look at every other lexeme and every other cell all at once, all highlighted in green there. And then the problem is it's not designed by a linguist. It's designed by someone who's never heard about language. So it goes, oh, I know the best way to guess what the missing cell is. You just take the most frequent one of all of those things that you've highlighted. So it just looks across the whole system and just takes the most frequent exponent from anywhere. This, of course, is a woeful way to guess correctly because it ignores the fact that exponents belong to certain paradigm cells. You can't just pick the most frequent exponent in the whole language for your genitive plural. You should go for the genitive plural exponents for the genitive plural. Um, so linguists would never have a system. Why am I even bothering to talk about it? Well, I'm talking about it because if you don't know anything about inflection, that's actually the baseline system that you would go for. Um, and that kind of uh, ludicrous as it is, shows us um, that whatever the cognitive system is, it's not a completely generic flavorless statistical engine. It has to be somehow sensitive to the fact that language is language uh, and it's got some structure to it. So although I said, could we just say that we forget about all of cognition, it's just this tiny little uh, inference mechanism? Well, no, cognition, you can't just dismiss cognition based on my model. Please don't do that. Uh, it's not what I want to say. So let's leave behind the woeful system and we'll try things, we'll try to get to the attentive system, but we'll do it a little bit more gradually this time. All right, so let's say first that we want to attend to many lexemes and at the moment we'll just do two cells and we'll get this right first. So my question is, how could we get this system to run efficiently? So I'm attentive and I'm looking at multiple other lexemes. Remember my basic unit of comparison is always comparing one evidence lexeme and one focal uh, lexeme. And now what I want to do is just repeat that basic unit of comparison, but using this evidence lexeme, that one, that one, that one, right? So I'll do it many times over. Well, that's one way I could do it. So how do I do it? Do I just make a ton of comparisons every time? What if half of the lexemes in my language all have the same two exponents 
in cell A and cell B? Do I just keep running the same inference, you know, a thousand times over? Um, well, no way, not if I want to be efficient. If I want to be a, an efficient cognitive system, let's not just do the same thing a thousand times over. Let's keep something like a lookup table here. A table like this that tells me uh, for all of the pairings of cell A with cell B, what's the percentage of the, the language that has that pairing? And now rather than running my simple little heuristic a thousand times over for all of the ones that have um and is, I'll just do it once. And I know that whatever the answer I get for that, that's 30% of the lexicon. And that's a much more efficient way of getting the job done. So this is just logical efficiency. If the task is to run the inference system that I want to have, that is attentive to many uh, lexemes and two cells, this is what a non-wasteful system would do. It would keep track of this lookup table. Great. Now, what if I want to be attentive not only to many lexemes, but also to many cells? So we want to run this basic unit of comparison, choosing not only different lexemes, but also different choices of the cell to be cell A. Cell B, of course, is fixed by right, where the question mark is. Um, right. So if I'm being attentive and I'm looking at multiple lexemes and multiple other cells, what's the efficient way to do it? Well, now the efficient way to do it is take a really big lookup table like this, which has got all of the entries, so that if I'm comparing uh, this cell and this cell, I can look at those two, go off and run it, and know that that accounts for 10% of the, the lexicon. But then what are we looking at here? Well, first, as I said, we're looking at the efficient way of doing multi-cell inference, so you're not wasting your time running the same question thousands of times over. But secondly, of course, that's a table of inflection classes. That is an explicit, cognitively represented table of morphemes. Um, and this is just a little bit ironic, right? <laughs> so um, in the model from the first hour today, cognition had a tiny little role to play, just one little heuristic, and that's all. But if my reasoning over the past couple of slides is uh, right, then even if the core inference process is just this one little heuristic, you'd actually want to wrap it up and surround it with a cognitive support system that has a much bigger role to play. And that is to say, even if morphomes can emerge spontaneously, just like I presented in the first hour, from nothing but uh, evolution and a core uh, mechanism of exponent inference whose definition does not refer to morphomes, even if that's true, still the system which best supports that exponent inference, ironically enough, may well contain um, explicitly represented morphemes after all, which is a kind of curious thing to get to, right? So that's why I say, please don't take my model and say cognition is dead. It's not. <laughs> it's got a life to live still. But we actually have further to go with this. So far, my discussion has here has been in the realm of simple models. And as long as I stay in that realm, it appears so far that the best um, kind of broader cognitive system to support efficient uh, exponent in, uh, inference is going to look like a classic morphomic representation. But there's more to life than just efficiency. We can also start to de-idealize and get a little, little bit more realistic as well. So let's go to the next system, which I call hyper-attentive uh, inference. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, morphemes are autonomous categories that don't line up with other categories in the grammar. Nevertheless, uh, morphemes like inflection classes often do partly align with other factors like semantics, um, phonology, morphosyntactic properties like gender. Um, in that case, since there's a partial alignment, these other factors would actually help us to predict, not with total certainty, but we like doing probabilistic prediction by now, uh, they'll help us predict which inflection classes a lexeme might have. So probabilistic inference could quite handily take these additional factors into account. So a hyper-attentive inference mechanism should add these factors to our big table. Um, so we'll add some extra columns for phonology, for gender, whatever you like um, in there. And as we do that, it once again starts looking less 
like classic morphomic representation. Um, and moreover, if we're being realistic about all of this, we should think about missing data. And this gets important. In reality, our lookup table for any speaker is actually full of holes. Right? This was part of the point I made uh, last time. Um, these are the inflected forms that the speaker hasn't heard yet. Um, and even more importantly, the younger a speaker is, uh, and the closer that person is to the age at which they're actually setting up all of this cognitive system, um, the more and more holes they are. So the, the holiness uh, gets more important as you get uh, younger at the time when you're actually building this system to support your inference. So we also will need um, to be uh, nimble. And what do I mean by that? Suppose that you as a speaker are trying to maintain this table over time as you're learning the language. Each time that you are exposed to a new form, which helps you replace one of those question marks with an actual exponent, you're then going to need to go to your table and check, did I just accidentally create a new inflection class? If so, do I split this cell? Do I recalculate what the frequencies are of the various parts? Or now that I've filled it in, have I managed to collapse two of them together, in which case I should go and recalculate all of these frequencies again? So as you learn new lexemes, as you're just hearing new forms, um, you'll need to keep updating all of these frequencies all the time, reformatting the, the columns uh, and the, the rows. Um, likewise, if you figure out, oh, gender is, is giving me some predictive information, I'll add that as a column, but then I'll split these things here. Um, so just a few slides back. I was taking this table here and I was selling it to you as this is the path to efficiency. But as we see now in the real world, um, it appears to be really costly. Maintaining this thing is horrible. Like it's great to use it, but the upkeep is just really draining. Um, so in a real world with missing data and constant updates, um, the whole thing may be actually quite costly to maintain. And so we come back to the question, what should a real efficient system do here? So one uh, thing you might do, so recent research in cognitive science has argued that what we limited humans, you know, demands on doing things efficiently, um, often do as a domain general strategy for making inferences is not to keep a great big table like that, but is to sample available data. That is reach into a bag of memory traces, pull out just some of them, and use that as the basis for reasoning. So for exponent in, uh, inference, what we might do is sample a bunch of lexemes rather than keeping a table that has the information about all of them. And the great thing about sampling is that as the, lexi as the lexicon changes, that's fine because so too will the samples that you reach in and pull out of the bag uh, and that are uh, informing the inference process. And all of that is happening without this huge cost of maintaining that lookup table. So we're getting the sort of dynamic uh, changing of information basically for free. So we then get our sample, we hand it over to uh, the inference mechanism, um, which works like the models that I've uh, been describing, um, which is good. But if we're going to be doing that, let's think about it. If we're relying on samples, then what would be really helpful now, as Olivia said, um, <laughs> is that we should structure the lexicon in a certain way. Um, so that samples will be drawn out, guided by factors like semant semantic uh, information or phonological stuff. So we get a, a sample not only of a random bunch, but of a bunch that are semantically related or phonologically similar like that. Um, and in the space of a couple of slides, this really flips on its head the whole question of what kind of cognitive system might support um, exponent in the uh, inference. So just a couple of slides ago, I was saying, oh my goodness, look what supports it really well. It's classic morphomic explicit representations cognitively. And now I've backed away from that. I'm saying what we want is a structured lexicon, um, which sounds much more like, you know, modern day um, uh, with all of these uh, sort of other uh, bells and, and whistles, um, which is kind of converging with, you know, other lines of evidence for the cognitive system being like that. But what I'm showing you here is from one model, we're getting all of these different implications that you can get depending on how carefully you think about it. Um, one more thing. 
Suppose that you have a, sim, uh, a system and it's doing sampling. But what you find is as you're doing this sampling, you're just repeatedly drawing out really similar samples, sending them off to the inference thing, getting back a really similar result. Um, this is starts to get wasteful. Like I'm doing all of this work and I know what's going to happen. I'm going to pull these ones out and get this result back again. So it may be efficient uh, in that uh, circumstance to amortize. And this is uh, another um, idea that I'm, I'm pulling from uh, recent cognitive science work. And that is essentially note down what the inferential question was that you were trying to answer by doing your sample and running the procedure. And then the next, and, and also note down the answer that you got when you did it all. So you noted down what the question was and what the answer was. And then the next time that you get a really similar question with some probability, just don't bother. Just use the answer that you got before, right? Whenever you, with some probability though, you do go through the, the full process. And whenever you do go through the full process, check to see whether you got the same answer yet again. Um, and if you are still getting the same answer, then increase your probability of just taking the shortcut next time. And interestingly, if you do that kind of procedure, that organically will lead to, sorry, this is what I was saying, but if you do that kind of procedure, that's going to organically lead you from having a short-term memory that you might throw away later initially to getting more and more reason to keeping it and making it more and more fixed um, so it turns into a long-term memory. So what I'm, what I'm describing here is what you might do in a model, but really this, this relates in an interesting way to the idea of a target system, which is how we lay down memories if what we're doing is running an inference procedure and wanting to do it uh, efficiently. And so then it's uh, an open question what you would predict uh, you would get for this in terms of the representations that you have cognitively for a morphological system. And this is something I absolutely have not worked out in full yet, but I think it opens up really uh, interesting questions that we can begin to think about. Um, so with all of that, let me now uh, conclude uh, this part. So in the first hour, I presented a model. And in the second hour, I've talked about its interpretation. So we started uh, by noting that <laughs> our model of evolved morphomes um, or our model evolved morphomes even uh, without cognitively representing them. That was kind of exciting and scary because uh, I just got morphomes to appear and I didn't represent them and I always thought that they had to be represented. But then, um, as I discussed how you would actually go about building a supporting cognitive system to run that model, then we found that you actually, well, uh, you, it seems you, first that you would uh, keep representations that look very much like traditional representations of morphomes. But then as I started to push us to think about de-idealizing the model in another uh, direction, um, you know, what, what if inference pays attention to more than just the exponents? Uh, what if a speaker has gaps in their paradigms? What if these gaps are being filled over time so things are now dynamic? Um, each of these questions, as it so happened, um, then led us further away from the, the classical idea of uh, representing uh, morphomes uh, explicitly uh, in cognitive terms. So I guess my, my final point is this, in just one hour, we went from the position of no traditionally represented cognitive morphomes to, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, yes, they're all there, they're exactly as we always thought traditionally, to, oh, no, wait a minute, cancel that. Actually, the whole thing is a beautifully structured lexicon with sampling and so forth. Um, so it was really quite a wild ride. Um, and in one way, uh, one of the, the benefits that I hope that we get from this is just a demonstration of the really important part that it plays when you're using models of interpreting them carefully. Um, and so I think it's really easy to feel that you've just done five years of work, getting models to work, you've run the data, let's just publish it with a short little discussion section. Um, actually, there's a lot of very interesting stuff to be done uh, with the discussion of models, um, and uh, it, it can be really quite interesting. And of course, as I was doing all of that discussion, you just see sparks of ideas of what we might do next as well. 
And I should just say, as for morphomes, what do I believe after all of this um, sort of belief threatening uh, experience? I'm not. I'm not committed to any of the conclusions at this point, to be quite honest. It's been a, a very interesting journey for me. Um, I think at, at this point, what I would say is we don't know enough uh, to know what it could be, but it's a really interesting situation to be in. Um, uh, if you, you know, believe that morphomes are there and need an explanation, uh, the explanation could get really seriously interesting. It's a lot more interesting than just saying they're cognitively represented, done, go home. Um, all right. That's it for uh, my talk about models. I've got a final slide to wrap up the entire course, but I'll pause now if there's questions about the, the modeling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so because we're not really sold on any hypothesis yet, um, isn't it the next step to, I don't know if it's really the ethos and cognitive science to then, once you have these cognitive hypotheses, on the table, um, go back to the models, modify them to incorporate these different content representations mm -hmm. and try them out on your systems. Like how do they fare yeah. um, compared to whether that would be a direction of research, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So um, what, as far as I understand what I hope my future is, um, is, is to develop, so I gave you models that, just to sort of like do this, do this, do this, the really simple little hardwired instructions. But yeah. something more cognitively realistic would be some kind of Bayesian reasoning or something similar to it that's where you're more explicit about what's the evidence, what are the hypotheses, do the so the top-down hypotheses, are they fixed ones like I've got here, or are they ones that come with probability distributions? Can we quantify this in certain ways? Um, so that would be a, a nice direction. Or, uh, to head in. Um, just as a trivial thing, um, all through this discussion, I did still assume that what's at the core is that tiny little heuristic that only deals with one evidence vaccine at a time and one cell at a time. You could build a heuristic that actually can deal with more than one at a time. Um, so one of the things uh, I actually, thank you very much, had time to work on here in Paris during my stay was with a, a mathematician colleague to sort of start working out, formalizing that properly uh, for doing joint inference with multiple lexemes and uh, multiple cells. And I don't know what the model will behave like once we do that, but it's an, another important step to do. Okay. Thanks for the question. What do you send a message? Oh, oh yeah, sure. this was just, thanks. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Um, I'll just say a few more words um, and there will be time after this. Oh, yes, it's far from trivial. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important. <laughs> right, good. Thanks. Right. <laughs> so, um, so thank you very, very much for your participation in the course. Everyone that's in the room, everyone's online. Um, uh, thanks very, very much to LabEx for bringing me here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me just do the shortest of summaries. So um, here's what we covered over four uh, seminars. We began with the fundamentals of scientific modeling where I uh, established some key concepts about modeling, which we've been using ever since, uh, including things about probability and uh, Bayesian reasoning. We then looked at implementations of modeling for language change, and we saw some central models uh, then applied to questions of language change. After doing that, uh, we narrowed our scope Finally, to uh, modeling inflectional morphology and analogical change. Um, first, with uh, last week, this uh, creative uh, cognitive creativity of analogy, where we looked at uh, different models that people have proposed over the time and found that they're really, very diverse. And then finally, today, evolutionary consequences of analogy, including um, a fairly extended consideration of one of the most important parts of using models, which is their interpretation. And it can really be one of the, the most fun parts too. Um, so after all of this, I hope you feel that maybe the, the gap here between people who never do modeling and people who are really comfortable with it has uh, closed somewhat. Um, and even most importantly, that you see that modeling of language change can relate to and even help solve questions that really, really matter to us working linguists and will always matter to us. And these are tools that potentially can help. And they are the tools that you can engage with. Even if you don't do modeling yourself, 
hopefully at the end of uh, this course, you would be happy to be a reviewer of a paper and you could have some intelligent questions um, to ask and make sure that these people doing modeling are not getting away with making silly interpretations of their models, however wonderful that they think they are and so forth. Um, that's it. I think we're going to organize to have, well, the most of it was recorded. Yeah. So that will appear at some time. And I'll share the slides for the first session, which wasn't recorded as well. Um, so thank you very much. Do you have more questions after that? Okay. Okay. So I guess we'll have thank to you. Go. Well, yeah, yeah, no, it's just just thanks. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs>